RTR deficiencies, IR, CRs. So follow them. So this slide provides outline of my presentation. I'll briefly talk about uh, RTRs and deficiencies and how we can avoid them. Then moving to the considerations of selection of resolution method and acceptance criteria, how we at Biopharmaceutics see it. So briefly we'll talk about what we have done previously, historical perspective, then moving to current perspective, little details on that. Then I have put some slides uh, for common resolution deficiencies. It's mostly take home message. And then before finishing, we'll talk briefly about how we are moving forward in biopharmaceutics towards the dissolution. So let me confess, I, I stole this slide from Varun. And uh, you have seen this slide in the morning. But this pie, which reflects the deficiency related to RTRs, 5% are due to dissolution. 5% is a big number. We don't want to see that. We want to see a zero there. We want dissolution-related RTR deficiencies to be out of this pie. That is our goal. And we can do it together. So these are a few deficiencies that you might have seen in the morning, and I have listed them again. It's like incomplete dissolution data. When you have multiple strength, data not provided for all the strengths, for uh, modified release products, ER products kind of things. So you don't have multimedia resolution testing. And when there is a need for alcohol dose dumping, the data is missing. So what we advise in those situations? A simple advice is select your method appropriately. The method should be product specific, and that's the keyword, product specific method. Okay? Summit dissolution method information and completion. Partial information does not help us. It does not help you too. So whenever, whatever method you are using, provide a justification. Why you selected that method? It's not like you just, just went to some reference and then uh, USP or somewhere, you picked up the method and put it there. No, there should be some rational behind it and put it so that our art, this uh, filing friends can look at that justification and they can receive the application nicely. Once you have uh, selected method justification, provide complete information data. As I said, we are big fan of N is equal to 12. So provide complete set of data. We also look at the dispersion of the data. So provide means, ranges, those kind of things. And plots, they are big help. For modified release products, in particular the extended release product, we want to see data for uh, in multi-pH, and this is for mainly for biowaver purposes. For some applications, modified applications, so modified you know, release uh, products, we want to see alcohol dose dumping potential, right? Whenever that is the case, provide that information and provide that in completion. Now this is case of functional score tablets too. When the tablets are scored and you can break them to dose, we want to see dissolution data with, uh, after splitting the tablets. So provide that data. So in my opinion, this product specific guidance provides you a lot of good information. What kind of data we are looking for. And you can go there, find that information, and submit the data as for the guidance page. If you have questions, and this is the link for that, you, you must have seen this yesterday. If you have questions, you can write a control correspondence to us. We'll be happy to answer that. And there was, I think there was some question yesterday about control correspondence and dissolution. So I'll, I'll be taking those questions today here. So let's move to our current standing. How at biopharmaceutics, division of biopharmaceutics, how we look into selection of dissolution method and what you can do. So this is kind of old slide. I have used it a couple of times and this provides uh, a historical perspective. How division of bioclients at OGD, how historically they have selected the resolution methods for ANDs. And you can see that the first thing is go to the USP. If there's a monograph containing US uh, dissolution method, pick up that method. Try your product with that method. If that method is suitable for your product, use that method. 
if there's a no, mo no monograph, if there's FT recommended method, and if that is suitable for your product, use that method. If there's no USB monograph, no FT database, you are always free to develop your own method and justify it. So that's how we have done business sometime back, five, six years back maybe. This slide provides you the current perspective, how we see things now. And as Dr. Kropcha was saying that yesterday, the patient, the, the end user is our focus. So in vivo data is our focus. And how the in vitro data, that is in vitro release data, resolution data, resolution specifications, that is method as well as acceptance criteria combined how they are related to the end user, the patient. So what we want to do is, we want to have this relationship between in vitro and in vivo. You can have direct relationship, and if you don't have this, we, we have these uh, more powerful tools now, which we never had before, in silico tools. You can use those tools to establish the link between in vitro and vivo. So PVPK modeling, we are increasing that. Feel free to use it. Develop your math methods, develop your models, validate them, and share with us. We'll be happy to provide inputs on that. But this is our current perspective. What it tells us is the bottom line is drug uh, or dissolution methods are drug product specific. So your formulations are unique, and you know uh, most about your formulation. You are developing your formulations. So you develop your drug product specific resolution methods, which you can use for development, you can use for life cycle management. So the key is the resolution should be drug product specific. And another key word is risk. Since BCS is in picture, right, we know that uh, the risk associated with different products are different. So this slide provides you a risk evaluation. I use it very often. So if you see that for BCS class one and class three kind of products, which contains highly soluble APIs, which dissolves rapidly, right, and when they reach to the intestine, they are kind of in solution state. The risk is low. When the risk is low, you do not have to spend too much of resources in developing a new method. Whatever information is available, please use that. However, when the risk is high, like in BCS class two, class four drug products, we strongly recommend you to have product specific method, which evaluates the risk, which ensures the quality of the product not only at the beginning, but throughout the life cycle of the product. Go to this uh, 2007 17 guidance about BCS, and I think it provides a good source of information. So, moving to 2008 uh, 18 guidance uh, for IR products, which contains highly soluble drug substance and which dissolves very rapidly, right? So if your product is something like uh, it's not ODT, it's not a sublingual tablet, it does not contain NTI, narrow therapeutic index drug, rapid onset of action is not needed. It's not like for angina or something like that or migraine. And your product does not contain any excipient, which has potential to affect the absorption like uh, mannitol, sorbitol, or SLS, or those kind of surfactants, right? And you have determined that your product is pretty stable. It remains there. There is no increase or decrease in dissolution, assays, and all that. Then follow the guidance. Follow what, what the guidance is telling you to, to use. So the guidance provides uh, two dissolution methods. So as per guidance, you can use USB apparatus 1, 500 ml, HCL. USB apparatus to same conditions, no surfactant. Okay, let me take a step back here. Whenever you use this, please provide us equilibrium solubility data across the pH. That is a big help. We can evaluate the risk much better. One more thing, 
if your product has been designated as BCS class 1, class 3 by the FDA, my opinion is you should be able to use Beyond HCL. So if your product is, has been designated BCS class 1, class 2, I think you should be able to use pH 4.5, 6.8, or whatever is appropriate for your product. And when you use that, feel free to propose these kind of acceptance criteria, not less than 80% during 30 minutes. We'll be happy to take it. When this happens, you do not have to worry much about USP method or FT recommended method. Simply use these conditions and justify why you are using it for DFR people so that they can read your justification and accept these methods as is. No issues, no IR potential. So we can significantly reduce the IRs following this way. But remember, evaluation of the risk is the key. Go back, take a step back, understand your product, evaluate the risk, and then decide. OK. But we know that not all products are low risk products. There are other products too. There are BCS2 class 4 products too. There are, there are products with highly soluble drug, but they release slowly because of other reasons. And we strongly recommend you develop your own methods. FTA method or USP method can be good starting points. They are not the end points. We can use those methods, but when you use those methods, optimize those methods. Demonstrate that those methods are suitable for your product. So they are product specific. Right? Modified release products. You understand modified release products are high risk products. So we want to understand the risk associated with it and how dissolution and dissolution method and dissolution acceptance criteria, that is dissolution specification, can mitigate the risk associated with these modified release products. So methods are case by case. You have different formulation. You have unique formulation. So the selected dissolution method should able to meet your unique needs. Feel free to develop your own method. Demonstrate that it's suitable for your product. Optimize the method. When the risk is high, optimize it more. But how do you do that? So when you have to optimize dissolution method, there are three elements to it. The first is evaluation of the method. So you select a method, you evaluate that. And how you do that, we'll discuss that. And this is the key element. Demonstration of the discriminating ability. This is one way of telling us this, is met this method is suitable. Whatever method you have selected is a suitable method for your product. And then selection of acceptance criteria. Remember, we are using dissolution conditions as quality control tool, and the method is only one element of that. The other element is acceptance criteria. You spend significant amount of time developing a good method if the acceptance criteria are not tight enough and if they do not mitigate the risk, then the dissolution specifications are not meaningful. So you have to focus on acceptance criteria, what you propose. They should be meaningful. So how do you evaluate the method? So the basic, go to, go to basics. Start looking at solubility. Solubility in aqueous media. Solubility in acetone, methanol, Alcohol, they are useful for some other scenarios. For us, biopharmaceutics, when we are developing dissolution methods, we want to see solubility in aqueous media across different pH values. That helps us to evaluate the risk. That helps you to understand your product, understand your method. Sink conditions. We have been using sink conditions for long. But let me tell you that they are not required. They are just recommended. If you tell me, I have a method, but I, I don't have sync conditions, but it's, I, uh, I have IV, IVR, IV, IV, IVC, and it can predict the in vivo performance, I will take that anyways. So understand that part. Don't, don't, you don't have to use sync conditions always. Once you have solubility data, sync condition data, go and select your medium, appropriate medium based on the drug characteristics, like whether your drug is basic or acidic and what are the solubility conditions, these things define. And then guide you to a selection of appropriate medium. 
once that has been done appropriate method we generally use, uh, recommend selection of uh, compendial apparatus they are seven depending on the needs try to use them then rotation speed agitation speed whatever is needed surfactant surfactant is uh, is important how you select the surfactant for example i would rarely uh, if i have to develop my method i would try to avoid slrs if i my formulation is is a capsule because down the line there is a potential of cross linking and slrs has interaction with enzymes so think about that think in advance and select the surfactant appropriately then method validation when we talk about method validation we are talking about validation of the dissolution method conditions rotation speed volume medium etc and the analytical portion both validation of both components is a very both components are very important so submit that so discriminating ability this is big question so what are the what are our expectation about the discriminating dissolution method we believe that a method which is discriminating or we call discriminating should able to do these things it should able to reject batches which are bad batches or which are aberrant batches or which are different batches and how we demonstrate that so you have to take a step back and see what are the cpps critical process parameters or critical material attributes which has potential to affect your dissolution the dissolution of your product identify that and then challenge the method by changing those cma cpps and change them 10 20% if you change 100% it does not give much of information you have disintegrating agent you remove it from 100% to 0% well we know that most methods will pick that up but we do not we cannot say that it's it's a discriminating with regard to change in disintegrating agents so select those changes prudently if your method can pick up the changes what are happening on stability conditions if somebody is keeping your product in in harsher conditions high humidity and all that and if your method can pick up those changes this is good method this can discriminate this can pick up the changes use that method and this is one big thing i wish i could change the order if the but uh, this last point as first point but the expectation becomes too much then if somebody asks me what is a discriminating method in two sense a method which can di distinguish a bioclant batch from a non bioclant batch that is discriminating if you have that method share with us we'll be happy to take that when i say that go back and see your pilot studies your field studies use data on there and try to demonstrate your method can pick up the, those changes that is very very important in selection of dissolution method setting acceptance criteria that is uh, one critical element of dissolution specifications when we set up acceptance criteria we look into the b batch data exhibit batch data you have to understand if b batch data is like that the exhibit batch data cannot be like that if the exhibit batch data are different from the b batch you have to look into that it's difficult to put them together then why they are different find reasons for that and modify it our expectation is all the batches should should be performing similar to the bioclant batch at time of approval and at, at throughout the shelf life so as i said we are big fan of uh, these profiles with n is equal to 12 use that and for ir products put up acceptance criteria where and uh, when q is equal to not less than 80% so look into your data do not propose acceptance criteria based on some some other sources your product is unique your dissolution method is unique and your dissolution acceptance criteria are based on your product performance so use your data to propose something 
for slow dissolving products and carbamazepine is a typical example. The other products too, you can use multi-stage or more than one time point acceptance criteria. For modify or extra release products, we follow the same thing. One major difference is the vendor, plus minus 10 percent. So it does not help us if you propose, for example, if the data is 50 percent in four hours, and you propose an acceptance criteria of 35 to 70 percent, it does not help us. It does not make the method as a good quality control tool. So propose your acceptance criteria prudently. Otherwise, that will generate another IR. We can certainly reduce it if you propose the acceptance criteria which are meaningful and your product specific. So in general, uh, for MR products, ER products, we tend to have at least three points. But if your formulation is complex, we can have more, more than three points. Like uh, it contains IR, ER, DR components. When the profile becomes complex, it warrants more appropriate dissolution acceptance criteria. So pick up the points. Pick up those infection points which, which can reflect the changes happening. So how we do it? So we evaluate all the data available. We start with the VE data and put all the information together on table. Look into the CMC information, look at the uh, bioclance point estimates, windows, 90% uh, confidence intervals, and CMC information, discriminating ability. And we try to put acceptance criteria which can ensure similar or B product performance throughout the shelf life. So this is the key. So this slide provides an example. So this is a BCS class 2 kind of drug subs. Uh, drug product containing a low soluble, high soluble drugs, uh, low soluble drug substance, and the dissolution can be affected by the particle size. And you can see that the lower bound is the lower bound limit of the particle size distribution of this drug substance, and the upper bound is the upper boundary of the particle size distribution. So this line tells us that around 15 percent. The upper bound has crossed 80 percent. So we may be inclined to put acceptance criteria at uh, 15 minutes, which will give us a good discriminating ability because now the dissolution method and acceptance criteria combining can discriminate a method from, uh, from a method which is, which, which is using drug substance of much higher particle size. But we are lucky in this case. So what we found was the lower bound and upper bound, there was biosteady. The applicant demonstrated that these uh, limits, the products using drug, drug substance in these limits are bioequivalent. That was very helpful. And we could move the limits to 80% Q in 30 minutes, keeping the discriminating ability of the method. Because here, at 30 minutes too, we can tell very safely that drug product, uh, all these drug products are bioequivalent to the clinical batch. Okay, common deficiencies. So this is one of the most common deficiencies and generates a lot of IRs from us. And we can certainly reduce it with your help. So many times the resolution acceptance criteria which are proposed are very wide. I mean, think. Your dissolution is happening in 10 minutes, 100 percent, 95 percent in 10 minutes. And the proposed acceptance criteria is 70 Q, 75 Q in 45 minutes, 60 minutes. It does not help. We will not accept that. So we will generate, this will generate an IR. So be prudent, propose an acceptance criteria which is related to your drug product performance. And uh, here, basically, I'm summarizing how you can take it. So for low solubility drugs, uh, draw a line where it's N is equal to this, Q is equal to 80 percent. 80%. For low risk products, uh, you can use uh, Q is equal to 30 in 30, uh, 80 percent in 30 minutes. And for modified release products, 
see your profiles, how complex the profile is, and pick up the points appropriately. If you do that, we will be happy to accept your proposed acceptance criteria. We are doing it for many applicants. For TR products, usually we tend to have two set of acceptance criteria for acid phase as well as the buffer phase, and depending on the design of the drug product. So dissolution method validation. As I said before, we want to see method validation of both the components, the method as well as the analytical portion. Functionally stored tablets. So when the tablet is stored, there is a, there's a potential that somebody may break it. And so we want to ensure that both the split parts, uh, the in vitro performance are similar. So you need to conduct dissolution with both split portions. And this is how we recommend that you should do that. If you have this complete information and data, I do not anticipate an IR for this reason. High variability. High variability in resolution data is very common. So whenever you see high variability, identify the root cause of high variability. Whether it's coming from your product or process or the method, right? So if you see the data that's going to FTA, it contains high variability, try to resolve that. And here I'm not talking about high variability at five minutes, 10 minutes. That does not bother me at all. I mean, it can be high, we understand it very well. I'm talking about high variability at later time points. For IAS at say 30 minutes, the mean dissolution is 95% and few units are 75%. It does not help. We need to address this, those things. Why, the, why that's happening? If that is happening due to dissolution method, improve your dissolution method. If that's happening your process, due to your process or product, improve your product. So what we want to see is, is, uh, is there any potential of this high variability uh, which, which can affect the in vivo performance? You should address that question. I understand that in, uh, you you may probably not able to resolve high, resolve high this variability issue in every case. So address that. So incomplete stability resolution data. So as uh, we were talking during stability to mostly we see one point resolution specification uh, stability data. What we want to see, and we, we are propagating this idea for long in NDAs, and we have been telling this at way in days too, that we want to see complete dissolution profile. That is important, because if you want to demonstrate the discriminating ability of your dissolution method with regard to stability conditions, and we want to see the profile, whether the profile is shifting or not, one point dissolution data does not help us. So please provide that. Super uh, a big help whenever you do spec kind of changes. But whenever you do that, use dissolution, provide complete information, complete data, use the batches which are more relevant. Fresh batch. The expired batch data does not help us. So complete information on pre-change, post-change, and for modified release products, uh, at least three-point resolution data. My personal opinion is profiles are always helpful whether it's coming from modified release products or IAS. They, they help us to understand the risk. So if you can generate and submit profiles, I understand it takes time. I understand it takes effort. But it helps us to evaluate the risk. If you do that, this will generate less IR. And we can approve it in first two cycle itself. So this is, uh, IVRT related to solid dosage forms, uh, semi-solid dosage forms, creams, and all that. In general, we do not ask for dissolution specifications for these products. And there's a challenge when spec kind of changes happening, right? We want to see in vitro release data for these products. So you need to develop an appropriate method and validate it and show us that method is appropriate for your product. My personal opinion is what you should do is when you are developing your product, you should develop the method there itself and to us. 
we'll, we will evaluate that information at the beginning itself. You can use this method at the, uh, for product development or whatever reasons, keep it and keep it approved and then you don't have to use it if you don't have to. But you can use it when spec kind of change is happening. The benefit of this approach is you will have always data, resolution data or drug release data with your bio batch. So moving forward, so this is the key. The end, uh, end, end user, the patient or subject who are using the drug product is key. And we try to establish resolution specification method and acceptance criteria, keeping our focus on the end user, the patient. And we strongly believe biopharmaceutics can play a significant role. We have seen it in so many applications. Biopharmaceutics play a pivotal role there in linking the in vitro performance and in vivo performance. We try to do that. It will be very helpful for you, for us. It will, if you use that, I anticipate less IRs, plus TV cycle approvals and all that. So please use that. And if you have questions, ask us, control correspondence, those kind of things. So we are moving forward, more clinical relevance areas, use bio-relevant resolution media, IVIVC. I understand IVIVC expectation is too high sometimes. Try to do IVIVR, use PVPK modeling, use in silico tools, and then evaluate the risk associated with your product. Because the two words, drug safety and drug efficacy throughout the life are very important for us. So evaluate the risk associated with your, your own product. And then develop product specific dissolution methods. Develop it nicely, validate it, and then implement it. And the acceptance criteria are product specific. So propose your own acceptance criteria based on your own product and dissolution performance. When you do that, put all the information together and then propose it. If you take that approach, I do not anticipate many IRs. So conclusion, and let me read it. It's, uh, what we have seen is refuse to receive and filing IRs, resolution deficiencies can be avoided by submitting complete information. This is our experience in the last couple of years, many years, I guess. We have not seen major biopharmaceutics issues leading to CRs. Sometimes it happens but we can certainly avoid it by developing a more product-specific dissolution method. These are the considerations that I have tried to list here. You can take that home. If you follow them, I'm pretty sure first review cycle approvals will definitely increase. Provide all this information and data. We'll be happy to review it early as possible. One thing probably I forgot to mention before is for modified release products or IRs. When you are developing your own method, when you are doing all that work, if you can submit that information is in a separate dissolution development report, it will be big help to the reviewers. They can go to one location, look at all information at one time, and approve it. Setting of dissolution acceptance criteria should be based on data of your proposed product and serene creation, and some complete information data. If you have that, there is no reason for us to ask more information. We are to help you, and uh, the mindset that I see, at least in biopharmaceutics and other divisions around us, there is no tendency to increase regulatory burden. We want to reduce it, and this is our effort. Tell us what, tell you what, what our expectations are, so that when you're developing your drug products, you can develop relevant information and submit to us, and we are ready to accept it as it's coming the way we want to see it. So this is acknowledgement slide. I would definitely like to acknowledge our division of filing reviews. I talked to them, and they helped me to build initial slides in my biopharmacy.